Hey, I'm Chris Kazan. Сегодня четверг. Устраивайся поудобнее. Ты на зеленом диване. So as you probably heard from the intro, we do have a special guest tonight on the podcast. Unfortunately, Bill cannot be here with me. He is back east. He had to go home to deal with some family issues. And as much as we like to talk about our our private lives on this podcast, I'm going to respect Bill's privacy. And we're just going to say he will be back next week. And we'll just kind of leave it at that. But I do want to thank some people, the members of the band Kevin and the members of the band Polar Tropica. They were supposed to come in today and we were going to do a bunch of interviews and talk. And I really appreciate you guys being flexible and because this all happened last minute. And I I want to thank you for being cool about this. And we we will have you back in and we will get you guys on the green couch. So tonight's guest, we do get a lot of questions about Uh, People want to know how we ended up working with a rock singer from Moscow. So I figured, you know, since it's just me tonight, I would just kind of give you guys the backstory of how Chris Kazin kind of happened. And later on, we'll talk to her. We did like a Skype call and you'll hear a couple of songs. Both are unreleased. One has been played on the Stone and Steel radio show. So I want to give a shout out to Telly Dio, Meister Matt, and Lisette. You guys have been big supporters of Chris, and we really appreciate you playing the songs. Um, And the other song they're going to play is completely unreleased that you're only going to hear it here. So the story behind Chris Kazin, it really starts with a magic bass. And I mentioned this magic bass on our first episode with King Mala. I had... $200 $200 left over from a job and I've been writing songs for a little bit and it just occurred to me that I needed a bass. So I, you know, like what most musicians do, they go and look at online and, you know, see what's on Craigslist or even at a guitar center. And for $200, you can't, yeah, you can't really get anything good. Uh, so a luthier friend of mine, uh, I went down to his shop. Um, I, I do some, like a side hustle for him. And I walked in and in the middle of his shop, he had a really amazing base and it just was all kinds of crazy woods and dials and stuff like that. His name was Maddie, And I said, Maddie, dude, this base is amazing. And he's like, ah, I, you know, I fucked up the headstock. And he's like, yeah, you know, I'm gonna have to start over and do all kinds of stuff. And he was just kind of in a, he was a little bit more surly than Maddie normally is. So as I turned around on his workbench was this bass. So I asked him, I said, you know, Maddie, what's up with this thing? And he said, well, I was compelled to make a bass. So I found some spare parts and some leftover butcher block that I had laying around in the shop. And I said, oh, so you, you were compelled. You made this under compulsion. He's like, He's like, yeah. So I said, well, I'll give you 200 bucks. And he was like, okay. And he's like, do you want me to finish it? And I said, no. And I just grabbed it out of his hands and I I just took the base. I don't even think I finished the job that I was supposed to do. I just gave him 200 bucks and I left. So I took it back um, and I took it back to my studio And I just um, immediately just plugged it in and I just started plucking around and I came up with this, you know, with the, with a baseline and it's one of those things that just couldn't get out of my head. I kept playing it. And one of our recent guests, Chris Brochu is a friend of mine. We do some songwriting together. Uh, He came into the studio and he heard me playing the riff and he was like, oh, dude, you should really work that up into a song. So we sat and we just kind of, you know, we kind of plucked around with it for a bit. And I eventually 
did work it into a song. Um, it, it will actually, the first song that we're going to hear tonight, Poker Face, was the riff that I was playing on the bass that became that song. Um, and thanks to Chris Brochu saying, dude, you should work that up into a song. Uh, it became a song. So it needed something else. And, and um, so I contacted an old bandmate of mine, my buddy, Ben, Ben Morris. I sent him the tracks. I said, Hey man, you know, it needs a little something else. So a couple of days later, he sends me back the track with his stuff that he put on there. And I was like, Oh, that's, you know, that's really cool. And it just, you know, the song just kind of sat until the next one came about. And then most people that come in to do interviews or even just come into my studio, they, they know I have, I have a small collection of guitars that are just, it's my midlife crisis. That's what happens. You know, some guys buy cars. I just buy vintage guitars and that's kind of how it is. So one night I was late, was working and I, I saw a 1979 Gibson Les Paul uh, on eBay. So I bought it. And the thing about a 1979 Gibson Les Paul is when you get a Les Paul, all that comes out is like rock, like, you know, like dad rock licks. So I just started writing classic rock licks. And I would, I would do the same thing. I would just write these songs and I, you know, I kind of put drums in and stuff like that. And I would send it to my buddy, Ben, and he would put another part on top of it. And I'd be like, cool. And I would just put it on the pile of the songs that we were, we were writing. It was kind of like a fun thing. Um, and it just, we just kept going and it just kind of kept going that way. The, the Les Paul was doing its magic. I was just writing songs and, and we got about, I don't know, eight songs in. And, you know, Ben said, hey, man, we should probably find someone to sing on these songs. And I was like, you know what? That's a good idea because they're, they're, they're incomplete. You know, they're just kind of sitting there and there's no, you know, they're just unfinished. And, and I, was, I felt kind of sad that the, the, the songs were... As much as I enjoyed writing these songs, there's something about an unfinished song that just kind of makes you sad. So I heard a female voice on this music. For some reason, I just heard, you know, just like a, just a strong female voice. Uh, you know, I kind of like that for the, that rock and roll feeling. So I set out on this quest to find the voice. And, you know, I know musicians that are listening or people you, you guys know what I'm talking about. You just hear that voice or you hear that tone and you kind of go for it. So I started looking and I put out, I put out ads and, you know, and you, you do the, the typical things. You put out ads in Craigslist and, you, you know, you ask around and, and stuff like that. And I found out that, you know, everybody likes rock and roll. You go, hey man, you know, I got this rock project. And it was like, yeah, totally cool. But specifically in L.A., Nobody likes to sing rock music and I get it, you know? So uh, a friend turned me on to this website called vocalizer.com. And it's just a, a place where producers and vocalists can connect. You have to register as a producer. And I did put up some music and I started looking through singers and I put in my parameters and you know, you can, you can just kind of, you know how it is. You just kind of do all the things. You put in all your parameters and I just got name after name and they have, you know, people's bios and they have pictures and, and they have demo songs. And I remember it was 50 people per page. I was like, I was amazed how many, how many people fit this parameter of like one to sing rock and, you know, and I started listening to voice after voice and I came to realize that Everybody kind of now sounds the same. And I'm going to, I'm going to like sidestep this for a second. Uh, a friend of mine asked me to listen to his friend's demo tape. And, you know, she was a singer songwriter and he said, what'd you think? And I said, well, she's good. He's like, well, that's great. I was like, well, no, everybody's good. You have to be different. And that's what I was looking for 
on this vocalizer thing, there was amazing singers and it seemed like everybody could sing. So I just listened to voice after voice and they all kind of sounded the same. Um, they all kind of fell into different categories of Amy Winehouse or, or Sia or, you know, that type of thing. And so I spent, I spent two weeks just listening to voices. I got to the bottom of page 25 and I just finished listening to about 1300 people sing. There was a, a, a girl named Chris from Moscow. And I remember seeing her demo tape was uh, a Poison song. It was Unskinny Bop by Poison. And I thought to myself, (laughs) this is going to be good, right? And I I played the song and immediately, immediately I knew that was the voice. So, and we talk about this in, in our interview, but I did, I sent her the songs. and almost as long as it took for her to listen to all the songs, I got an email back and said, I'm in. At that point, when she said, I'm in, I thought to myself, this is, this is crazy. And how are we going to make this work? And I had no idea where this was all going to lead. I just kind of knew that if we just kind of kept going with it, something would happen. So, here we are a couple of years later. It's, it's been just over two years now. We figure out a way to make it work. And it's kind of a, it's kind of a testament to, to music and the connectivity that we all share. And you'll hear Chris talk about it in her interview about how she feels and, and her experiences are very similar, but because of this whole experiment, and just kind of reaching out and trying to find something and taking that that shot when you find the thing that you think is right for you, it opened up a whole new path. And that's the amazing part. Because of this, we have we have a record company and it's new and it's small, but it's growing. And we have a podcast and and it's all because Somebody that I didn't know listened to my music and said, I'm in. So that's how we came upon Chris Kazin. So right now, um, we're going to play a song called Poker Face, and then we'll jump into my interview with Chris Kazin. Think they know you well 
Okay, so we just listened to Poker Face uh, by Chris Kaysen. She's here with us. Not really with us, but she's here via conferencing. Uh, she's in her apartment in Moscow, and it, it is probably, like, what, 9.30 there right now? 9.30 at night? She's nodding. So it's 9.30 at night. <laughs> You're absolutely right. <laughs> yeah, all right. This is one thing that's weird about, I can tell you, working with Chris, is the time difference makes it kind of odd because I'm usually awake when you're going to sleep and vice versa. You're like, so you'll send me a text. It'd be like seven o'clock at night there. I'd be like, Hey, good morning. You know, we've been working for about a year this way in this odd time zone. But anyways, so I've been telling people about you, you know, for the past year and you know, we have the stickers out that I've put some of the stickers out now. And if you want a sticker, I'll tell you how to get a sticker. If you want to get a free sticker, go to chriscason.net and sign up on her mailing list and i will send you a free sticker or we will send you a free oh rest send me a sticker please <laughs> <laughs> all right we will send you a sticker because here's the deal with the stickers initially i had sent all of them to moscow to me yeah yeah <laughs> 500, 500 pieces <laughs> 500 500 stickers uh and they got sent back to me so now they're here in la and if you want a sticker Go to chriskazen.net, sign up on her mailing list, and we will send you, uh, actually, it'll be two free stickers, or you could have a choice of either Los Angeles or Moscow or both, and they'll be, we'll put pictures of the stickers on our Instagram. But anyways, so getting back to how we kind of met, and I just want to talk about your background, because a lot of people don't know, because when I tell them, you're like, you're, you're a rock singer in Moscow, they're like, Huh? So how did you get into rock music? Because you told me it was your dad, right? That uh, parents are always to blame. So that was my dad, who actually, um, when he uh, appeared in my life, and because my biological father, I never knew him. So I, my stepfather is, is my dad. Uh, I've been always calling him dad. So uh, he came into my life when I was five and he brought a lot of rock music. <laughs> uh, there were many foreign bands I never heard before, of course. And uh, that was, there were Scorpions, Nazareth, um, ACDC, Deep Purple, um, Rolling Stones. Uh, just classic rock. And and we kind of call it here dad rock here. It's now dad rock. <laughs> so, I mean, it, so it's fitting. It's fitting that your dad got you into dad rock. But it's unusual, right? That's like, like when you were growing up, were you the only person into rock and roll? Because I, I, from what I understand, the, the Moscow scene is not really receptive to like hard rock and just rock and roll in general. So my uh, my schoolmates, my friends, they were listen listening different music there were um pop music russian pop music uh mostly in high school i had a few a very few friends who shared my interest in rock music and um, that was awesome because we were changing cds some usb devices with mp3 music so that's why we were enlarging our uh view of the world in uh, rock music and in Western music, also and that was that was a very cool time because to get something, to get some new music, and uh, I don't remember when exactly I decided to become a rock star, <laughs> but I think uh, I wanted to become a singer since. Since I remember myself, because my parents, they told me that every time we had guests or we didn't have guests, I was like on the table dancing and having something in my in my palm, like microphone. <laughs> <laughs> and I was starting a performance and I always needed spectators. I demanded someone to watch my performance. So I wanted that badly since my childhood. Uh, but I think that about uh, high school, I decided that I want to play rock. And I started bands. There were 
very many. <laughs> um, and I wrote music. I wrote lyrics. That's kind of the quintessential like rock and roll experience here that that a lot of young musicians have. And it doesn't matter whether whatever genre for you it was rock, but for other musicians that we talked to, and, and even from experience, there is that moment where you decide, you know, I want to be in a band and I, I want to like perform and stuff like that. So it's very, it is very normal. And, you know, like, I don't know how, what your high school bands, rock bands were like. My high school rock bands, because I was in, you know, I was in like a couple and we had like terrible names like Spectrum or something like that. Um, we were we were just bad, but that's all part of it. That's, you know, being in a bad band in high school is kind of that, how you learn to uh, perform, you know? it's Yeah, yeah, right. Every experience is an experience and that's great. We all uh, have some starting point. It, it's impossible to become flawless, perfect, right here and right now. So we are making our way to to the top. It's a long way to the top if you want to rock and roll. <laughs> that is so true. You know, uh, when I was growing up in high school, I was a rocker. I had the long hair and everybody else... <laughs> Right. Everybody else in my school was all clean cut and everything like that. So, but they always, they always identified me as like, oh, he's a rock and roll guy or he's, we we're, you know, I had like a leather jacket. So uh, they called us rats. We were a rat. So if you were a rat, you were into rock music and you smoked pot and, and you just kind of lived that rock and roll lifestyle. So when you were in high school growing up, did they identify you as the rock and roll girl or a rocker, or you just kind of because right now, like when I, there's pictures of you on Instagram and even on your personal Instagram that that I've seen, you you look like a you look like a rock and roller. Were you always like that? Like, did you always kind of dress in that, you know, rock star fashion? And or were you identified as a rock girl in this? No, or were you just kind? Of, or did you have to wear like uniforms and stuff at, at school? I think if you see some pictures of mine in school. <laughs> Uh, you will find me ridiculous <laughs> because, um, you know, I, I was searching for myself uh, and I didn't know, I didn't have sense of style, first of all, because I don't think that many children have. So it's something that you you are bringing, bringing up in yourself. Yeah, you are developing this taste and uh, I just knew that I didn't want to be like everyone else, like my schoolmates and especially girls. Um, it's a physical thing, uh, psychical. I don't know how to explain something that you are feeling awkward about and you are um, not ashamed of. But Yeah, it, you just feel weird. You, you, it, you, you feel different. So you start to like, try to look different from the rest of the people. And I know that's how I was when I was growing up. I looked at all those people and said, uh, I'm not uh, like, I'm not like you. And, you know, and everybody has that same thing growing up. It, 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 like school pictures, there's always that weird, awkward time where you're trying to find yourself. And, yeah. you know, and, uh, you know, Bill knows this, um, even though he's, he's probably going to listen to this and laugh, but I went through like a weird disco phase. You know, I went through a weird disco phase where I had like the satin shirt and I, you know, but I was, but that's that kind of weird thing that growing up uh, happens to everybody. So, I, I mean, I find it interesting that the experience uh, that you had is similar to, you know, it's across the globe and many years apart. It's very similar. So it's like a universal thing for, I think, for the people that find themselves as outsiders or musicians, because musicians are usually outsiders that they have that weird moment of like, oh, I, I don't fit with you guys. Therefore, uh, I'm going to try to find my own identity. Yeah. And <laughs> there was one thing. Yes. Uh, I never wanted to look like a girl. I don't know why, because I felt some brutality in me. And I, I was very boyish. I didn't feel like, like being a lady, you know. So... Uh, manners and all this 
stuff. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so my my parents, especially my mom, they she always wanted me to look like like a lady, to behave like a lady, to be to be very to be a lady. <laughs> but I didn't want that. <laughs> and you know, because music and everything in my life uh, that I like, it had another spirit. So that's why I preferred uh, to wear pants instead of skirts. I hated dresses and skirts and all the stuff because I was searching for myself. I changed religions. You know, I were a goth. I were a punk. I were a rapper. So I wore those ridiculous wide pants and big boots and uh, there was a very strange time in my life <laughs> because I, I tried to identify where did I belong so I think it took me a very long time to understand that it happened a couple of years ago <laughs> <laughs> yep <laughs> So everything in me, you know, I was like a rebel. I was like a rebel. Every teenager, um, there's a rebel in every teenager, I think. And I always had more friends among boys and girls. So, and of course, some boys, they also wanted to play rock, to be cool, <laughs> uh, to attract girls, you know, because many boys play rock to attract girls that's so the, that's why we were in the same boat <laughs> right um that's the the main reason why i got into to rock was to to meet chicks so i get you on that one i remember when i was searching for singers you were on vocalizer and i was looking on vocalizer and i remember hearing it was unskinny bop was your demo tape and i thought oh this is going to be good and it was and you had sent some links to the to the videos that you had on 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 YouTube. Some of them were from you were doing a, a tour in China and we'll we'll talk about that in a second. And some of them were with your cover band. You were like in the absolute worst cover band in Moscow. <laughs> like they were they were terrible. But and you know you could tell that there wasn't a lot of people in these clubs, but you were performing like there was like thousands of people there. And I was like holy shit. Like this uh, this girl is a rock star, and then I and then I went to see some of the videos of you performing in in China, and I was like, "What the fuck?" So <laughs> that's when I knew I had to send you the material. So for those who are who are listening to this the first time, I'll see if I can find those links. We'll put them in the the bio, and you can see Chris dressed up as an alien. But that was the thing, and then you know when when you talk about you kind of just go up there and and have fun the like i said those videos that you kind of send me as we kind of chat of you just going oh this is me in the rehearsal studio or, or just even a karaoke you're jumping around and you're you're punching the air and stuff like that even like the and i'll explain to the people that that are listening the the process that we do when we write a song together is we work out the lyrics and then she goes into re- rehearsal studio and she'll send me a video of her in the rehearsal studio performing the songs and even in the rehearsal studios you're performing so i remember telling people are going, ah, oh, I found I found this singer in Moscow and she's a fucking rock star. And people are like, ah, oh, I don't okay, whatever. But um but we will put some links there and uh and you can see if I can still find them. I know I, I they might be taken down, but if I can find them, we'll put some links up uh of Chris dressed as an alien all in silver and just kind of doing her thing. So you did a, like a six month tour in China with uh this kind of like cover band performance thing it was called aliens or something like that yep right that was called aliens i had been working for a for a very long time in a huge media company in my hometown and uh i was dreaming uh i've been dreaming about being a full-time musician you know so when i suddenly got that contract uh, I said yes in a minute, in a moment. So I didn't hesitate a moment to decide. So I left that job. Uh, it was very highly paid for my hometown. And 
it was like a step to nowhere. But I went there for a half a year. Uh, I didn't have working visa. I had tourist visa. So it was illegal to be there for me. But band I was invited to, that was not a very typical band for China. They had a very, a very, very few bands there like us because we were playing live and we were avant-garde, you know, those futuristic costumes and super powerful show, rock show. And that's what I wanted. I wanted not only just play rock, I wanted to make show, a really good show. And that was that what we had been doing. That was really great. That was amazing. I I have never seen something like that here in Russia because it was a really a top quality show to some extent. But we were illegal. <laughs> but I never told about that to my parents. I never told about that to anyone except my very close friends. Because if my parents knew, I don't know, they would kill me or my mom just was in tears. And it was hysteria when she found out that I quit the job and I was leaving to live in another country. <laughs> that was crazy. She she was she was almost about to go crazy, to go mad. Um, she was crying. She crying out that I was a killer to her. <laughs> <laughs> but I wanted to change my life. I, I wanted to change my life so desperately that I agreed to go there to people I never met, I never seen, I never knew. All right, and this is kind of cool because you were in an in a legal rock band in China, and that's actually pretty right. cool. That's actually pretty cool. <laughs> you know, that's a funny thing because I'm in an illegal rock band in China, and almost everyone knows about us because we have our pictures, uh, huge pictures, almost on every wall in every city. <laughs> but we are illegal, and that's. That's weird. That's no, it's that's you know, amazing. it's amazing. It's amazing, and it's cool, and it's it's very rock and roll, and it's just one of those things that very few people get to experience. But I think it's like one of the cool things, and the videos of that illegal rock band in China that really kind of sold me on on you. So when I saw that, I was like, oh my god, this is this is my girl. So I remember I was like, I'm just gonna take a shot. I there was a link to send you an email, and I sent you an email. And I, it was just to, I had a private SoundCloud set list and I was like, well, these are the songs. And I sent them to you and I didn't expect to hear from you at all. I was like, because you probably don't know this, but prior I had, you know, n nobody wanted to sing all my music. And I was like, ah, oh, all right. So I, I wasn't expecting a response. And then you responded. <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't know how to explain but, you know, when I got that email from one side, that was like a miracle. And that was, that was weird. What? Because I got used uh, to receive some spam, <laughs> every kind of letters. But on the other hand, I wasn't surprised. I've been waiting for something like that. Somewhere inside of me, I was ready for something like that. So I was just like, cool. I'm ready. <laughs> I'm always ready to do something weird. <laughs> right. No, because I remember it was really simple. Like, and it, it was almost the exact amount of time. I think the playlist was like 29 minutes long. And it was almost like 29 minutes later, you had sent this, this just really short email. I was just like, I'm in. And I was like, oh shit, this is kind of amazing. So since then, we've kind of like came up with the workflow and how to do this between the, the two countries. And we're going to listen to a song now called Rebel Side. And yeah. yeah, and when we come back, we'll talk about that and, and what's going on. So this is Chris Kazin, Rebel Side. Born and raised to be a thief. Mama told me to be naive. For a ride So before I run to water 
rock, I was taught to fight. Gotta run, gotta hide from the light. Gotta save myself, gotta save my friend. Not a lamb, oh God, wanna live my life. It's a rebel side, rebel side. On the rebel side, always plain as black and white. Renunciation of shame and slavery. No more envy. Take what's mine. This time, don't believe. Told me one crucial thing. His papers only good to rub his bones in. Gotta run, gotta hide from the light. Gotta save myself, gotta save my pride. Not a lamb, oh God, wanna live my life. It's a rebel side, rebel side. On the rebel side, always plain as black and white. Random situation of shame. Okay, so that was Rebel Side by Chris. Rebel K- Side. Rebel Side by Chris Kaysen. <laughs> um, when we do music, like I explained, you uh, usually go into uh, a rehearsal studio and you send me videos. But prior to that, you go in and you do what you what you call your wardrobe records. After every time I write some new song, and I'm like, oh. Let's go to the wardrobe records. And I'm opening my wardrobe and I'm taking off my clothes out of there and put myself instead of them. I'm taking my pillows and blanket just to make sure that my neighbors won't kill me to isolate the noise. (laughs) And I'm recording my new songs there. And after that, I just uh, send them to uh, to Raz, <laughs> who's on the green couch. <laughs> right. So basically, you go in the closet and you sing into your <laughs> iPhone and you uh, you send me that. And then from there, we go into the, the, the studio. I can say that my first uh, listener is uh, the dust in my house. <laughs> right. So, uh, yes. So the dust in your house is the first people to hear the songs. So I remember you, we, we were talking and then I hadn't heard from you a couple of days and you're like, oh, I'm sorry. I had a fever. Uh, and in this fever, no, I wrote these. I'm dying. <laughs> yeah, right. He said, in this oh. fever, I, uh, I wrote these songs and then you sent me Rebel Side. And, yeah. <laughs> and I was like, oh, th- 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 I mean, I was like, whoa, this is fucking great. W- what was the, the thought behind Rebel Side? This song is 
my story, my religion, my confession. <laughs> there are some things about my lessons from childhood. There is a line uh, about my mama also told me one more crucial thing. Newspapers are only good to rub the fish bones in. So probably this is what helped me a lot in my life because my mom taught me not to believe people. <laughs> uh, mm, I can't see. No, that doesn't mean that I don't believe people at all. I'm just very careful. I'm very cautious. And yeah, sometimes I'm skeptical because there have been too many people in my life who are t talking too much, promising too much. So, and uh, this song is about, it, it has a slight political shade. It has a slight shade of uh, human relationship. And uh, this is a protest to some extent. So this is my piece of advice to people who are in doubt, to children, to teenagers, to some adults who are in doubt which way to choose in their lives. And uh, there's also a line that you decide to keep yourself close to the feeder or to get rid of the, all of that stuff and to be yourself, to act according to your heart, to your beliefs, to your code of honor. It's not about, you know, like, fuck the system. It's about to build your own world, to live according to your own rules. Not destructive, but creative one. Right. Coming into this interview, we listened to Poker Face. And that, that has a similar theme, right? You know, um, sometimes it seems to me that I'm talking about same things from different sides in every new song. But as far as I can feel that I haven't said everything about it yet, I think I will keep on writing <laughs> about that. <laughs> because I feel like I have something to say. I have my own experience. And if there is someone who needs it, he will get my message. I remember what I was feeling when I was a child. I needed to have a conversation, to find out some things, to ask lots of questions. And I'm trying to remember myself at that time. And when I was a teenager also, because it was, it was not an easy time for me because I had tough relationships with my parents and I had lots of nervous, you know, breakdowns. Uh, I didn't have friends. And uh, I didn't fit. I was like a white crow, always. <laughs> yeah. And I had lots of questions about the world, about life. What is right? What is wrong? And uh, can I afford myself to be me? And what does it mean to be myself? What am I living for? Where am I going to? What's the sense of my life? You know, this is a very strange thing, but uh, my parents, they, especially my mom, she always said that life is for suffering. And uh, when you enjoy something, that's not right. This were, was haunting me for a very long time. And I always had lots of questions. So my songs, they are answers to those questions so when at last i understand that i found a remedy i found a clue i found the answer i feel like i need to speak about that i feel that i need to share this experience with the world because i know that somewhere is a little chris or not so very little <laughs> chris is asking the same questions and it's tearing him or her apart. So that's why I'm writing these songs. They are my 
my answers, my piece of advice. So that's what I'm ready to take responsibility for. Wow. That I okay. That was fucking cool. I'm trying to figure out a segue. Uh, so I just need a second. Um that is cool and it's a it's a very universal thing. And I've I've heard other songwriters say that their their songs are answers to their the questions that they have. So we just did song number five in the studio, right? Number five. Number five. So, mm, yeah. Yeah. And it's called uh, <gasps> Swamp 79. Uh, yeah! <laughs> yeah. And <laughs> we're going to get that mixed and out. But if people want to hear some of the songs that we have done, they can go to... Da -da 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 -dum, da -dum, Chris .net. <laughs> and you're welcome there. So guys, feel free to sign up onto the mailing list and you will get a secret, a very secret link to my songs. Ha. Awesome. <laughs> By the way, it's not that simple. <laughs> you will also become a member of, a, of the Rebels team. Right. And you will get free stickers if you also sign up. So and you, you will get free stickers. Yeah. Because... <laughs> Me, myself, I don't have these stickers, but you will get these stickers and I will, will envy you so much. <laughs> okay. So, yeah. So, you'll get a link uh, and some free stickers. Uh, and you can find Chris on Instagram. Uh, it's Chris underscore Kazen, right? K-A-I-Z-E-N. Is that correct? She's nodding her head yes. Okay. Yes. All right. Chris, I want to thank you for... Kind of being on the green couch because we did this video. <laughs> you know, uh, I, I'm almost feeling it with my butts. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. All right. We'll leave, we'll leave it at that. All right. Thanks, Chris. Oh, that's my favorite shade of green, by the way. Uh, in my childhood, I adored bubble gum of this color. <laughs> okay, okay. All right. All right, Chris. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Raz. On the Green Couch is a production of Art School Records in conjunction with and recorded at Project 4 Studios in Burbank, California. The show is edited by Raz with additional production support by Dixie Trussell. Please remember to subscribe, rate, and review us in Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. It all goes to helping other people find us. For more information, please visit our forever home on the web at artschoolrecords.com. I'm Bill Zunkin, and thanks for listening. <laughs>